Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all five of our uh, presenters. We now uh, have 25 minutes uh, for questions. I have a short list here, maybe to be supplemented in a moment. Uh, there'll be certainly plenty to chew on. I mean, I, I should think that last point, I, all of us would be uh, um, wanting to agree that there, they, there is a natural alliance. But I think there are plenty of instances, and I know Bennett, of course, will not deny this, where that alliance seems not to exist. Right. Um, <laughs> and I'm sure maybe that's, that's something in which, on, upon which people might want to pontificate or talk. Now, I do actually have now uh, eight uh, speakers, so I will just uh, launch into them. We have a preponderance of civil society people who may be going on that very last point that I've just made, uh, but we'll start with one of them. Um, uh, Tupaj Amaru, uh, who is from, it just says an, an Indian movement. That's pretty generic, but is Tupaj here? <laughs> Left. Okay, good. Uh, well, not bad, sorry, uh, bad. <laughs> but we will move on. Um, to uh, Erica George, who is the Center for Global Justice. Uh, is Erica here? Erica, please. Um, good afternoon. Um, Thank you very much for an interesting and important discussion. I'm Erica George. I'm with the University of Utah Center for Global Justice. And my question is to Mr. Freeman. Um, I share your concerns, actually, and I, maybe this is a pillow talk point, very interested in your bedfellows. I, I think that NGOs have been very effective in um, calling to attention human rights violations and abuses, and this is an important partnership to have. Um, and I'm curious about your role or the socially responsible investor's role in law and policy making, particularly um, 1502. As you may be aware, the Associate National Association of Manufacturers has now challenged that. This would be a provision requiring transparency and reporting for minerals coming out of the Democratic Republic of Congo and the country regions surrounding it. Um, so while there's been advancement, there's also b been resistance. Um, and I wonder how you as investors are helping to shape conversations. You mentioned how crucial multi-stakeholder negotiations and conversations have been for you. Um, but one of the criticisms of 1502 is has been that's been raised is that essentially the social information isn't material for investors. I mean, virtually everything published that's contrary or um, not supportive of that legislation suggests that what's material is um, what matters, which is finance and money. Um, you obviously have a more broad understanding of what we should be thinking about as investors and what matters. How do you bridge the gap in your community? Yeah. Thank you very much, Erica. If I may, I'll just take two or three and then and, and uh, spread them around. And if, if people could actually uh, take Erica's line and direct, if they could, direct their question at one or uh, other of our um, uh, panelists. I'll, I'll take um, Andrew Denny from Allen and Overy as well. Is Andrew here? Andrew. Hi. Um, I'm uh, chair of Allen and Overy's uh, Human Rights Working Group and uh, partner in the litigation department. Um, obviously, one of the key ways that banks um, can exert influence and, and this wonderful word leverage um, in their position is by through their lending and that is uh, we've had the equator principles in place for for many years now and just talking to partners in our finance group they point to one of the difficulties with the position of lender um, and exerting influence and leverage is that once you've lent the money, you've lent the money. And uh, that means that you're, you've only got a nuclear device in your pocket, and that's to, um, to basically call in the loan. If there's a breach of the loan conditions, including, say, the equator, the equator provisions in the lending agreement, uh, your, your only remedy is to call a default and to call in the loan. And that is a nuclear weapon. And it's obviously one which doesn't lend itself to much subtlety. Um, now, obviously, for a, a serious breach of human rights or breach of any of the other equator principles, one would be looking, may, may well be looking to terminate the loan. But give, does the panel have any views on how sort of softer um, forms of persuasion can be used or how you can, have, where, if there's some sort of middle ground? which might actually make this more effective. The comment being, because it's a nuclear weapon, in actual fact, what ends up happening 
is that it's never used and accordingly the, the principles really then don't have, have that much teeth. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks very much, Andrew. I, I wonder maybe that uh, Trike and maybe Ola might be able to uh, broach that particular uh, question. We'll take, one, we'll take one more and then we'll uh, give the panelists uh, a blast. Is it Andreas, is it Mishbash or Hispash from Mishbash from the Burn Declaration um, and Bank Track? Thank you. BankTrack is a network of civil society organizations that is working on banks and we have been engaging banks on sustainability standards in general and human rights standards in particular. And um, more than a year ago, a group of banks actually has announced that they are going to work on an implementation guide for the banking industry, the so-called Toon Group of Banks. We are waiting for that and I was wondering if anyone on the panel or in the room knows a little bit more where this in initiative is heading to. We're certainly very much interested in, uh, in what comes out, and we don't think that those issues are so new to the, f to the banking sector because we have been engaging them on human rights issues, on due diligence issues, and transparency issues for more than a decade. And my second question relates to the question of reg regulation. My o own organization, Burn Declaration, we have been approaching the Swiss banking regulator on human rights issues. We have tried to discuss human rights issues and especially UN guiding principles with the regulator, but actually haven't been successful at all because the regulator says it's beyond its mandate. It's not material. Same, same thing from the regulator because uh, their mandate is to protect banking clients and to uh, maintain or safeguard the stability of the financial system and human rights is out of that. If anyone on the panel ha would have an idea how we could break this impasse and actually get the regulators to think about human rights. Great. Uh, thanks very much for that, Andreas. And I will leave that open to them. Well, let's start with our first question, I think, which was directed at you, Bennett. Yeah, I'll hit it right in the head. Thank you. And I really appreciate the uh, question. Look, there are two provisions of Dodd-Frank um, that have been in play. Um, one directly related to human rights, 1502, conflict minerals. The other, less directly so, 1504, extractive revenue transparency, requiring companies uh, that are registered in U.S. stock exchanges to disclose various forms of revenue payments they make to the governments of companies around the world. Um, we at Calvert have been very significantly involved in supporting both, both through the legislative and then the two-year-long rulemaking process at the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. I will tell you that the, from an investor's point of view, that both sets of issues are indeed material. The issues at stake in 1504, revenue payments made uh, by companies to those governments are more quantifiable by definition. They're probably more understandably and demonstrably material to more investors who really have to worry about corruption, various tax regimes, and political risk in these oil, gas, and or mineral rich countries where they operate. And I would say that Conversely, that the issues at stake in 1502, conflict, uh, conflict minerals in the DRC, are harder to quantify. But that does not mean that they are necessarily less material. And I'll tell you why. I'll hit it right on the head. The smart investor, let alone an investor with a commitment to human rights or basic decency, does not want to knowingly invest in companies which knowingly use, however far removed from headquarters down their supply chain, who knowingly use minerals that are well established now to be fueling the conflict in the DRC, the bloodiest conflict in the whole world since the end of the Second World War. No investor worth their salt would knowingly want to own stock in companies that knowingly would accept those minerals in whether, the, however minor the component, in, in minuscule, wherever they are in the end product, that is material. 
And for that reason, on top of wanting to work with others to end that bloody conflict, we had absolutely no problem at Calvert, nor did a number of other investors in working with NGOs and those companies I mentioned, big multinationals in supporting 1502. And I'll just end it by saying that, you know, companies need to respect the democratic process. The legislation was enacted, you know, fair and square through Dodd-Frank. It was freestanding legislation for months before that. We then had a two-year-long process at the SEC, open and accessible to everyone. And some of the companies under the umbrella of the National Association of Manufacturers and the Chamber of Commerce, they didn't like the result. Well, you know, they had two years to make their case. Their case was made, uh, and the SEC commissioners came out with a rule that, frankly, we weren't thrilled with entirely, and, the, and NGOs even less so. But it was a fair, open process. And this is now overtime with this lawsuit, and it's out of order when people are getting killed in Congo every day, in part due to these so-called minerals, among many, many other factors. So it's time for the companies to start implementing this law and to drop this superfluous lawsuit after we had a very open and fair legislative and regulatory process in the United States. And it's, it's not as if uh, corporate lobbyists are thin on the ground in Congress either. So, uh, uh, Ola, would you, uh, you'd like to add something, so please? It was actually to the next questions. Oh, uh, oh, yeah. uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Absolutely, then that's fine. Uh, off we go to okay, the next. And great. Drika, would you like to also follow up on that question as well, please? Yeah, fine. Yeah, uh, was with uh, respect to the the loans and uh, uh, sort of the nuclear weapon. I think couldn't it be sensible. I'm not a finance lawyer. I'm an oil and gas lawyer, which is maybe even worse. But um, <laughs> but. Couldn't you just put the premium if they breach the conditions on human rights violations? Then you uh, put on an interest of two percent extra, but it doesn't go to the bank, but it goes into a human rights fund. So th then it's directly relevant as well, related to the breach. Would be quite simple, I guess, uh, and it would give the banks even a better uh, call or whatever. And then to the other one, to the bank making the regulators change the banks. The, the, the Swiss regulator changed the bank regulations. I would definitely think it's better to work with the banks or to find sort of a group of banks because they are so vulnerable these days still and sort of find some banks which want to demonstrate their way out of the wilderness uh, and be sensible and that's the way to work towards the regulator would be my guess but I don't know the Swiss regulator. We only hear rumors about <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that, that must be one of the most cryptic comments we've had in the whole. <laughs> Love that. Tea afterwards, we're going to exercise our right to reply. Uh, JK, uh, are you going to lead yes. us out of the uh, wilderness? Or um, at least your bank? Yes, just a comment about the financing of nuclear initiatives. Um, under normal circumstances, we would not finance nuclear weapons as such. I think it was to your question. <laughs> Loans, yeah. Ah, oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, okay. No, then it's fine. Good. I'm glad we cleared that up. Actually, that's that's the most important thing we've achieved in this whole session. Um, uh, now, Andreas, uh, perhaps Aldo, would you like to give a response and, and maybe Ron? Great. I, I'm not surprised uh, by, by the answer you received. Uh, I myself uh, had the chance to receive those answers in similar opportunities. Uh, one of the most interesting ones uh, at a meeting with G20 Sherpas, where we asked uh, this question about uh, how they saw the coherence between what they were uh, dealing in terms of uh, initiatives and the human rights framework and the normative framework coming out of the UN. And the answer was that the G20 was a body set up for a specific purpose, which was to look at economic policy reform in the world. Uh, so human rights had nothing to do with that. That was a portfolio of a different ministry. I think uh, that sort of argument is becoming increasingly untenable, uh, particularly now when we have guiding principles that really like guiding principle eight or nine, I will not quote them, 
for the sake of not boring the audience, but I think they are very clear about uh, the coherence that there needs to be between the human rights aspects of policy and what any of the entities, any of the organs of the state are doing, and that cannot exclude by any means the financial regulators. But of, of course, uh, this is not an argument, I think, uh, that we can also, uh, that we can only, uh, uh, that we only need to win on a legal basis. I think there are obviously a number of strategies, and I certainly think that uh, the issues of uh, regulators not addressing human rights in their work is something that certainly would warrant uh, complaints before human rights treaty monitoring bodies for countries that have, uh, uh, you know, um, agreed to, to abide by those conventions, by, by, by certain conventions. But um, I think it's also a political uh, uh, struggle that needs to be carried out. And in that sense, I think it is important to uh, make alliances and, and make, uh, and also to develop, uh, I think there is a lot of good research, but I think there's more need to, to show the relevance of the activities of financial regulators to some of these issues, like I, I try to give these examples in my presentation, but obviously there needs to be more substance to that, and I think we, we need to, to, to work more to, to, to make the argument that I think is becoming untenable, even more untenable, and, and untenable in the light and in the eyes of public opinion. And uh, I, I think there is, at, at this moment, certainly a very uh, important opportunity because uh, a lot of people are seeing very firsthand the impacts of not having had, for example, regulation to deal with too big to fail institutions, coming back to haunt states in terms of loss, loss of uh, jobs, loss of services, you know, many austerity measures as a result of not having that regulatory measures uh, in place. So to, you know, to, to argue for, for uh, a, a remedy and to have a legitimate voice in that discussion, uh, uh, I think it's, it's uh, to deny somebody that a voice in that discussion, somebody from, from a human rights perspective, I think it's, it's, uh, it will be increasingly difficult. Thank you. Uh, well, yeah, th thanks. Um, I would like to to go into the um, the nuclear option uh, issue. I think that 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 is a, a very good example. It, it came up in in our mapping exercise as well, and it also came up during negotiations of of the OECD guidelines. And the benefit of having emerging economies and developing countries uh, in the OECD guidelines uh, group now is that they really uh, showed us that disengagement should only be a last resort option. And they said, well, if companies or banks or uh, other institutions disengage or disinvest too early, then the result is counterproductive. Then no, no, we had this, this example of child labor in the supply chain. If you see so, uh, child labor in the supply chain and you um, disinvest or, or you disengage from the supply chain right away, then that's not helping the, those kids working in, in, in the cotton industry. So the, the, the primary task of both companies as well as investors is to help improve the situation. So that, that's one of the elements which was brought into to our negotiation by developing countries, and I think uh, rightly so. On loans, well, I think it's much more difficult than investing and, and, and providing equity but there are still a range of things you can do. Uh, and, and the one thing you can do is first have a tough discussion with the company itself. Um, of course, there, there is, you have hard power, and that's your nuclear option, but you have soft power as well. You can have that talk. And, and, and I know that uh, a lot of investors and a lot of uh, loan providers do not want to have this talk because they don't have uh, th this, this, this nuclear option and they don't have more subtle more subtle uh, options uh, in between. And if that talk doesn't help, then um, like, like we have said in, in, in supply chain responsibility, the other thing you can do is, is organize others who have the same view. So you can organize uh, other, because probably they have equity providers as well. Maybe you are in, you are in a consortium of, of loan providers. You can organize this group. You can organize your strange bedfellows and try to pressure uh, more in a multi-stakeholder way, this company to behave uh, and, and to stop uh, having adverse impacts on human rights. So th there is still a range of options you can you can explore, uh, but it's it's definitely more difficult than than just uh, uh, providing equity. 
Thanks, Ro. Uh, it was ever thus. Talk softly and carry a big stick. That's it. Um, <laughs> we've got three final uh, question, uh, yes, questioners. Uh, Ms. Wang from the International Graduate School at Zittau. Is Ms. Wang here? Yeah. There she is. Excellent. And if you could direct it at one of the, the panelists, it would be great. Thank you. Uh, hello. F uh, thank you for a chance that I can ask my question. Maybe it's not so specific enough, um, but I want to ask the expectants. Yeah. Do you think spe uh, speculation can be avoided in the finance financing sector? Because um, sp speculation plays also a big role um, that it violates human rights. And uh, when not, how will the finance sector improve the performance uh, in order to follow guardian principles? Uh, that's it. Let's, oh. Thanks very much. Yes, I think that's the, the nuclear option for the, for the panel, actually. Uh, speculation is finance. But I think maybe one of you can find a, a way to answer that in a moment. Let me just take the other two questioners. Uh, Ms. Bloem from Civicus. Bloem? Ms. Bloem? Yes or no? Thank you very much, um, uh, Civicus uh, Geneva section. Uh, I was quite struck. Just, just turn your head. Don't, don't worry about yes. turning away from okay, the panel. Okay, I was Talking quite struck, uh, first of all, for the great panel, but to see the distance what uh, Aldo told us and uh, the other speakers uh, were engaging in. I mean, when we heard Aldo and afterwards also other colleagues, and in that way my question has already been responded to, to I mean, there is this huge distance still that the financial system is definitely uh, particularly, I mean, not only banking as national banks, but definitely also central banks, very far away from even awareness of what their action are, you know, coming to at the end to the, uh, uh, to all the implications particular to, to social and economic rights. So I don't know, uh, you're a wonderful bank in South Africa and my headquarters is in South Africa, so I hope we are working with you. But I mean, this is so a wonderful, outstanding, <laughs> simple. When we hear what our people from the Burn Declaration, my colleague from Burn Declaration said, I mean, you talk to the banks, that's not their Monday. I mean, this is what we hear most of the time, what we hear also in other panels when they say, they, they hear already human rights, they get tired when they hear the word human rights. So, I mean, this is very, very far away yet from the reality, and I hope that what we heard from the other ones, particularly from the OECD, that this is working into that direction. And I don't know, you said uh, it took 20 years. Uh, I don't know how long we have to work until really what Aldo is really requesting, and that what is really then in reality will be. Thank you very much. That I, I actually might flick that to you, Bennett, when we come to it. And our final uh, questioner is uh, Gina Martin from the West Virginia University. Gina, are you here? Gina. Hi. I'm, it's actually Jenna Martin from West Virginia. There's no way you would know that from the name. Um, I, my question is directed towards Mr. Cagliari. Um, it's sort of a follow-up question on one of the earlier speakers, but you discussed this need for financial regulators to do their work informed by the human rights analysis. And I can tell you, as someone who used to work for the Securities and Exchange Commission, um, getting them within the agency to coordinate is a challenge, let's say. And given how many federal regulators are involved, uh, at least in the United States, on the financial side, so the FDIC, the Federal Reserve, the SEC, I was wondering how technically you envision this happening. Um, in other words, do you envision a new regulation or a new regulator being created? Do you uh, view an interagency task force? Um, it's one of those things that sounds great, and I agree with you completely, but how that translates into the real world is something I would like your insight on. Uh, great. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I'm just wondering whether um, the, sovereign wealth fund might the Sovereign Wealth Fund might address the, uh, the open-ended question about speculation. Uh, and finance, and um, but then uh, uh, if anyone else had something to add to that, that would be fine. But Aldo, you can take one of the questions and Bennett the other. So how about that? 
I also think that, as, uh, as the chair just said, I think that speculation and finance is very closely related, so it's impossible to really to get rid of it, I'm s sorry to say. <laughs> I think that's, I think it's uh, irrefutable. Um, Dennis. Um, on the uh, issue raised by the uh, questioner from Civicus, um, by the way, a wonderful organization, uh, look, speculation is a, is a huge problem. It's been with us for a couple millennia of history. It will never go away, but it's particularly pernicious uh, in the agricultural sector now in the 21st century and particularly threatening to um, uh, poor people's uh, lands and homes and especially threatening to indigenous peoples. And, you know, I, look, this is a tough one for investors, you know, who are in the business of evaluating risk. And I, there's been centuries of experience in looking at, at, at speculative bubbles and seeing them burst, uh, going back to, you know, Dutch tulips. Uh, I'm sorry that my Dutch colleague just left for my reference to uh, Dutch history in the early 18th century, I think, but um, maybe late 17th. But um, look, it's a, it's a significant problem, and there's a big boom now uh, in investing in agricultural land around the world. And we've got to be, as investors, very, very sensitive to these speculative bubbles. We've got to be very sensitive to land rights, human rights generally, labor rights, the environmental impacts, the use of GMOs, which are you know, a very double-edged sword um, with all the public health and environmental and cultural risks, yet the trade-off in trying to feed a hungry planet. So I'm glad you raised the question. And re investors are going to be wrestling with the uh, ups and downsides of uh, this kind of speculation as long as we're around. <laughs> and there's no, no easy answer other than to just be focused and beware now on over-speculation in, in agricultural land, particularly in places like Africa. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, and, and a final word to uh, Aldo, and I'm sorry, Aldo, I haven't left you much time, but brief, brief if you could. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, Maybe I'll just take the question that was addressed uh, directly to me. Yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, maybe uh, we have to start with things that are easier to do, practical things. So uh, meeting with, uh, calling meetings of uh, <coughs> human rights uh, organizations, for example, periodically to brief them on developments and get their inputs could be a great thing to do. It doesn't take a lot of effort, I would imagine. Um, there are uh, the, int I, 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 you know, there are the intra, government coordination issue that will also emerge, but, but I think it's, those are also important. You usually have the people with the expertise on human rights also being excluded from uh, the discussions on regulation. So uh, bringing those together at interagency task force could be a great vehicle uh, for doing that. Um, I, I think there are, there are a number of, of formats, uh, and one doesn't need to try to take it all at once, but I, I think there are uh, small steps can be taken, uh, you know, there is, uh, it is important, you know, the, the, to establish links with uh, bodies that work on human rights, if, when there, is na there are national human rights commissions, to work with national human rights commissions, you know, I, I think those, there's a range of measures that could be adopted that in a very pragmatic way as a first step. And then, you know, we, one can see how those mechanisms work and try to improve on them. Uh, before I ask you to thank everyone, I've been instructed that uh, you, are to, you are to be in the room, Roman numeral 20 uh, promptly at uh, 15.30. Uh, but could I ask you to thank our panelists? <laughs>